Oh, praise the Lord, all ye angels of his. Praise him, all his hosts. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Beloved, we are come together in the presence of Almighty God and of the whole company of heaven to offer unto him, to our Lord Jesus Christ, our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to make confession of our sins, to pray as well for others as for ourselves, that we may know more truly the greatness of God's love and show forth in our lives the fruits of his grace, and to ask on behalf of all such things as our well-being doth require. Wherefore, let us kneel in silence and remember God's presence with us now. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy way like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own heart. We have offended against thy holy Lord. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises, declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him, which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
A very warm welcome tonight to Choral Evensong on this second Sunday before Advent, both to those who join us in person, to those who join us online, and an especially warm welcome to any visiting for the first time. We continue to build in our expectation and preparation for the kingdom towards the feast of Christ the King next Sunday, and I draw your attention especially to our service of music and readings on that occasion next week. A very warm welcome also to our preacher tonight, the Reverend Dr. Ayla Lapine, whom we will hear more about later. And I hope very much you will join her, the choir, and the rest of the congregation for refreshments after the service in the old SCR. We stand now to join the choir in prayer as we sing tonight's psalm, the words of which and chant can be found on the sixth page of your booklet of notices.
The first lesson is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, beginning to read at the 26th verse. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Here ends the first lesson. We stand now to sing our office hymn, number 336.
The second lesson is taken from the Holy Gospel according to Luke, chapter 1, beginning at the 26th verse. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favoured one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words, and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Here endeth the second lesson.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
It's a huge pleasure and greatly to our benefit to have as the final preacher in our angelic sermon series of this Michaelmas term tonight, the Reverend Dr. Ayla Lapine, who is Associate Rector of St. James Piccadilly. Originally from a small island near Vancouver, Ayla moved to the UK in 2003 to study theology and art history. After a PhD in Victorian sacred architecture at the Courtauld Institute of Art, Ayla held fellowships at Yale's Institute of Sacred Music and at the Courtauld, and was a lecturer and fellow at the University of Essex. Ayla has also been a Canterbridgean, training for ordination at Westcott House, before ordination in 2018, and a curacy in Hampstead Parish Church. Before she joined the team at St. James in July of last year, she was Amundsen Fellow in Art and Religion at the National Gallery. Ayla is, in her own words, committed in her priesthood to beauty, to belonging, and to justice and it will be truly glorious to hear how her thought takes wing with what she brings us tonight on angels in art. And before that, the choir are going to give us a celestial treat with tonight's anthem, a setting of words by the 16th century poet Edmund Spencer by W.H. Harris. Fair is the heaven.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to tell you a story before I begin, which became shockingly relevant just this afternoon. This is an extraordinary series, and I'm so grateful to be here with all of you and to be part of it, and being able to focus on and to explore the angelic in a chapel like this, with your choir, and in the midst of this beautiful experience is a great joy. I'd like to tell you about arriving at Cambridge Station today, which I did by bus from Royston. I don't recommend it. <laughs> and as I was walking across the front of the station, I saw someone on a bicycle, and I thought, I know that person. Because as Arabella mentioned, I used to live in Cambridge. And I said, Martin. And he said, oh, hello. And we started a conversation. He said, do you remember the story about my daughter, which I knew part of, because he was part, and still is a part, of a congregation in Cambridge that I got to know when I was an ordinant here. I knew she had been very ill. He said that she died on the 6th of December last year that she had spent a month in hospice and that the hospice had found a place for the whole family to live, that she'd had tons of visitors and that her funeral had hundreds of people because she had touched so many lives. So we talked a little bit about grief. He is in his mid seventies now and so mourning the death of a beloved child is also for him very much mourning the death of someone who had also lived her life to the full in the span of years she had. He explained that when people ask him, how are you? He says, grieving. It means so many different things at once. And it's all he feels he can say. And so we talked a little bit about life's purpose, its meaning and how he chooses to fill his time now, building community as best he can. I know too that he's an artist. And so I said, Martin, do you still make art? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, will you give me some of your art? Because I'd been to visit him and seen his art studio before and I had wanted some for a long time and I thought, this is my moment. Will you give me some of your art? And he said, yes, of course. And he said, you know, I've been making angels. And I was amazed, and I said, I'm preaching at Selwyn tonight about angels and art. And he said, no way. And I said, yes way. <laughs> and he said, oh, well, I'll send you some of my angels, which he's been making in his grief. On the 6th of December, I encourage you all to remember his daughter, Jenny. And I, together with all of you now, and together with Martin and her family, remember Jenny now. May she rest in peace and rise in glory, and may angels sing her to her rest. And when we started this evening with the psalm, that great hymn to creation which we all sang together, we heard that God is clothed with majesty and honor, wrapped in light as in a garment. God as being itself, life's existence and origins, visible and invisible, embraced by infinite light. What an image of glory. It's also an image beyond imagination. It's the edge of what language can handle. And our scripture is full of those moments where language kind of gives out, even as it gives as much as it can. Because it's a vision that we can't grasp, but much like in visual art, we want to try. And the idea of light itself as a garment resonated with me in other ways too, because I'm encouraging us tonight to look at a Victorian photograph, which you have in your, uh, in your booklet towards the end. So if you've not yet discovered this, it's towards the end of your booklet. There are two images there that I'll be exploring with you. Light in photography is the kind of paintbrush 
photographic paper and chemicals as the surface upon which light plays and comes to life through a camera's lens. A brush, too, loaded with color like Burne Jones's was, pressing into a freshly primed surface, smooth across every angel feather. The majesty and honor of God is at the heart of all art, whether the artwork might be described as sacred or not, no matter where it comes from and no matter who made it. The reason why I say this is that as Christians, if we believe that all creation is a gift from God, as we heard in our, uniquely relation, in our unique relationship between God and humanity in our first reading from Genesis, if that gift is for us and with us, then the gift of art itself, the capacity for creativity and imagination in all its forms, that strange human urge to make and to share that which is made, is a manifestation of God's active and vivid presence in our world. Artists, as you know, have depicted angels in innumerable ways. They are creatures lively and bright, or perhaps their creatureliness is something more complex altogether, because they are utterly divinely mysterious. They're certainly not men. They're definitely not white. They proclaim the desires and truths of God. They appear as eyes and fire, voice, and music. They are intentionally and uncannily awed. They are terrifying in some moments in scripture to the extent that it's very important to not be afraid. And so that is regularly what they say. Every time an angel is depicted, that angel is of course a total approximation a fragment of possibility, a chance for wonder, something that hovers on the borderlands of what a creature might be at all. And so tonight, I've placed two 19th century British artists in conversation with the Hebrew Bible and the Gospels, the Annunciation and the first moments of creation, blooming across vast surfaces and depths of the world as we know it and the world as we do not know it. Julia Margaret Cameron, the photographer, started to paint with light in her 40s when she received a camera from her daughter. This gift, a relatively new technology, unlocked her vocation. She swiftly turned a greenhouse on the Isle of Wight into a makeshift studio. She invited family, friends, servants, and neighbors to pose as themselves, as figures in biblical and literary scenes, and as allegories and signs of the divine, the seasons, Emotions hidden within every heart. Angels are a theme for her, from the angel at the sepulchre to the angelic wings of cherub infants fluttering. And, of course, Gabriel, depicted here. Edward Burne Jones's story is different. He became an artist much earlier in life, together with the Pre-Raphaelites, and above all, alongside his dearest friend, the designer and writer, William Morris. William Morris and Edward Byrne Jones had a try initially at thinking that they might become priests and then they discovered quite quickly that that wasn't their thing. I can't blame them. They both started out as painters and William Morris also had a go at architecture. William Morris's first painting says on the back of the woman who would become his wife because he gave this a try, I cannot paint you but I love you. But Burne Jones discovered he was a pretty good painter at the same time that William Morris discovered that he was good at everything else. Not so good at painting, but very good at basically every other art. And in drawing, painting, mosaic, and stained glass, they worked together. Burne Jones offered angelic visions continually. In his work, they stand guard, play music, accompany people on heroic quests, hover alongside Jesus and the saints, and in this series that I'm showing you a little tiny piece of tonight, they hold strange orbs representing the days of creation in Genesis. There are six in this sequence, of course there are, but tonight I'm showing you a fragment not of the passage that we heard read earlier. 
but of the first day. Within this orb, if you look closely, very little and yet everything might be revealed to you. It's a swirl of zygotic cellular potential. Material coheres and drifts. Earth, sea, sky, the first things of life and its cycles are somehow encapsulated within the light embrace of angel hands. The angelic presence is therefore gigantic, like a cosmos in itself, a solar system in the body of the angel, shooting distant stars into feathers and trembling in the energy of those luminous figure, fingers as the universe itself, all that is made, somehow is contained in Burne Jones's orb, impossible to paint the edge of art like the edge of language. In Julia Margaret Cameron's photograph, lilies in full bloom hover in the dark shadowy air between a woman whose hands are crossed over her chest and a child with flowing hair and parted lips, Ave Maria. The cloth of the woman's dress, which is marked by edging around the neck, shoulder, and wrist, flows with qualities inherent to so much Renaissance art, which itself shares deep affinity with the textiles of antiquity. Time is layered upon time in images like this one. The woman covered by folds and swirls of cloth is seated. Her knee is prominent across the lower foreground, so much so that it has an odd presence of its own protruding from her body. Her right hand crosses over her left, and both palms are flat against the folds of the garment, separating flesh from flesh. Towards the upper left of the photograph, her hair merges with the background. Shadows around her neck and ear allow her face to emerge in profile, slightly blurred, perhaps a ghostly apparition. The lilies pulled into focus with a sharp contrast against the softness of the figures hover near a radiant zone with vaporous forms, either ascending like steam or swirling slowly like incense. Perhaps, as there is no dove visible in Cameron's photograph of the Annunciation, this could be suggestive of the Holy Spirit present in this divine moment. This woman is merry as she is pondering, taking it in and giving little away. She does not know that we are looking at her, and she is in a moment of discernment. Cameron's photograph is certainly inspired by Luke's account of the Annunciation, which we've heard, and it's also a response to the Italian Renaissance tradition of paintings which she knew so well. It is, in many ways, a relatively conventional depiction of this scene, at least at first glance, and it's often titled as After Perugino, an Italian Renaissance artist. But I keep asking Renaissance specialists, because as Arabella explained, I'm actually a 19th century specialist, and none of them can identify for me which Perugino painting Julia Margaret Cameron might be exploring. Perhaps it is a synthesis, perhaps it is her inspiration by Perugino, rather than a direct connection with a specific work of art. And so it is connected to the Western history of art in ways that the Burne Jones image is too, fluttering back and forward through time. And it's also something else, because it's blurry. You'll be pleased to know that this is not Selwyn's errant photocopiers at work. It is a blurry image. Cameron was ridiculed for her blurred technique. As a woman amateur who didn't know how to focus the lenses properly, the truth was she knew exactly what she was doing. She was painting with light. Tristram Powell has referred to the effect of Cameron's blurring as chancy. It's risky. And he says that whether a fluke or not, it could establish the beauty of a print, but she never knew how it was going to work out. Her method is even riskier than Burne Jones's because she has to wait and because she's not sure what the lack of focus will reveal or conceal. 
Like Burne Jones's image of that first day of creation, Cameron's photograph is certainly a response to conventional Christian iconography, but it does something new because of the way that it uses light as a metaphor for God's presence. The way that the divine in the everyday goes way beyond the everyday. The way that it takes us into things visible and invisible through the visible. God as a blur. Unseeable and unknowable, yet seen and known in Jesus, in action in the world, in creation, in the incarnation. And theology too, that God talk and God exploration, is an artistic act of a kind, weaving together what we can and can't see. We are always as limited human, as limited human beings out of focus. Blurriness is a part of the existence and it's a part of the limitation of humanity in general. And that can be incredibly difficult because focus would suggest the sharpness of clarity and understanding and would also suggest far more control than we actually have. Focus is all right, of course, it's much prized. But blurriness is good too. Not being able to envision everything precisely can be a very creative place to be because it gives us a kind of wisdom and humility of being able to say, I don't know. When things are blurry, we are most likely to acknowledge that we don't have all the answers. We are most likely to rely on others for help. We are most likely to be able to understand that our limitations have taken us to a place of incredible vulnerability. Cameron explained, my first success in my out-of-focus pictures was a fluke. That is to say that when focusing and coming to something which to my eye was very beautiful, I stopped there instead of screwing on the lens to the more definite focus which all other photographers insist upon. In other words, she discerned artistic triumph where others would see only failure and a lack of skill. A portrait of a child named Annie Philpott on the Isle of Wight, taken not long after Cameron received that camera from her daughter, was titled, My First Success. That photograph, of course it is, is really blurry. Burne Jones was often seen as being an escapist, someone who was sentimental, who was mired in Victorian romanticism to the extent that for quite a long time, his paintings were very cheap. They are not cheap anymore. So if you have millions and millions of pounds, maybe you two one day can get a Burne Jones. I think the drawings are still kind of affordable, but you'd still have to be fairly wealthy. So he's come back round again, but for a very long time, because of the kind of emotional character of his work, he was utterly marginalized. Burne Jones doesn't blur his edges and soften his brush in the same way. And his medium is different too, of course, but he too has a sense of God in the blur. The movement of air as wings pulse in his attempt to paint earth and beyond, pearl-like and womb-like, indistinct, yet utterly compelling, held by tender androgynous angel hands. Burne Jones seemed to offer a vision of pure potential in that orb the first flourishing moments of God speaking love into the universe, surrounded by angelic divine presence. And it's a failure. Who could ever depict that? He knew he couldn't. He tried anyway. Cameron's image of the Annunciation, like all images of the divine, is also a failure, not because it's blurry, not because it is accurate or inaccurate, but because art can't get us there but that's no reason to stop trying. No one knows what the Annunciation looked like. No one knows what the first moments of heaven and earth in God's speech and love looked like. So we are confronted by the limits as much as the expansiveness of imagination. And the angels sing their song of God's presence eternally, as do we in our own blurry way in the radiant music of heaven and earth. Amen.
Let us pray. Loving God, we offer our prayers now for all people and their situations, for lives that are going through upheaval or distress, for circumstances which only you can change. We pray for the church throughout the world, remembering those Christians in countries where their beliefs make them vulnerable and in danger. Uphold and strengthen all who are persecuted for their faith and guard them with angels. We give thanks for this chapel and the community who form around it. May we point to the way to God's kingdom in this college and our local community and welcome all who are seeking through our doors. Lord, in thy mercy. Creator God, we pray for peace in the world, for understanding between nations, religions and factions, and for an end to old scores which remain unsettled. We especially pray for the peoples of the Middle East as the conflict continues, that we may live alongside each other in mutual respect and harmony. May we learn to recognize each fellow human being as made in your divine image. Lord, in thy mercy. Amen. Father God, we thank you for sending your Son to us, for your willingness to come close. Set us free from the fear that makes us inward looking, and instead give us the courage to draw close to others. Give us, give us a renewed generosity with our time and the gifts you've given us. Give us a renewed concern for those who are struggling in our college and our local communities. Give us a renewed vision of what it is for us to be your church in this place at this time. Lord, in your, in your mercy. Amen. Forgiving God, send your healing forgiveness to all who are suffering feelings of guilt, shame or regret. Help to mend broken relationships. Be with all who feel that through advancing years or failing health they cannot enjoy life as it used to be. May those who are learning to live a new pattern of life feel you are walking beside them. We especially pray for the sick and the suffering in our community and give you thanks for those who are on a road to recovery. Lord, in thy mercy. <coughs> Merciful God, we remember those who have died and for those who are bereaved. May the light of Christ, which eternally shines, bring hope to their dark places. We especially pray for those whose anniversary falls at this time. Gracious God, forgive us when we only turn to you when things trouble us and when we forget to thank you for blessings and bounty. Help us to recognize all the wonderful things in your world for which we may be grateful and send us out this coming week ready to show our gratitude in all we do and say. But when we are experiencing grief, like Martin, would you grant us his courage to turn our grief and our pain into gifts of beauty for others? Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we stand now to sing our final hymn. Number 478, ye watchers and ye holy ones.
the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be amongst you and remain with you evermore. Amen. Amen.